This is a DeMeyer ProLine Atlantis stainless steel line frying pan. In today's video, we're going to run through all its stats and details, compare and contrast it to a few other pans, cook a bunch of hopefully delicious food, give this thing a big review, and figure out if this is a good frying pan for your money. Who knows? Let's get started. Okay, let's jump in and get to know this pan. The Demeyers are made in Belgium. So my first Belgish pan. Uh, part of the Zwilling J.A. Hinkles group. Uh, they also make the stove enamel cast irons. They make those Bob Kramer chef's knives that we like so much. So pretty good company there under that uh, Zwilling umbrella. This is the most expensive pan I have ever purchased, believe it or not. This pan cost me my own money $300. $300 for a stainless steel frying pan? Is that outrageous? We'll see here in a minute. This is a big daddy frying pan. 4.8 millimeters thick, seven layers. Good Lord, the thickest pan I have ever purchased. It's solidly in the booty pan category. Very thick, wide, heavy bottom if you're into that type of thing. And this is the 12.6 inch model. Never fully understood what 0.6 of an inch is, but that's the way a lot of the European pans are listed. It's really a 32 centimeter pan. And what I gotta say though, it's kind of like when guys start measuring things, there's a little bit of wiggle room. For example, this pan and this Debouillet Affinity pan are both listed as the same size, 32 centimeters, 12.6 inches. The Demeyer is an inch wider. How is that possible? I don't know, to be honest. Uh, you got stainless steel, and they say it's a Sylvanox surface, so there's kind of a treatment applied to the stainless steel cooking surface. In all honesty, I can't tell a whole lot of difference between this one and some of my other stainless steel cookware, but it does have a Sylvanox treatment. Induction compatible stainless steel on the outside, then those seven layers and 4.8 millimeters thick aluminum core. And just for simple comparison purposes, that 12 inch all clad D3 that everybody loves, less than three pounds there. This Demeyer, 12.6 inches, well over six pounds. So two and a half times heavier than that all clad D3. Not quite as heavy as the Lodge 12 inch cast iron, but I will say that cast iron is a little bit easier to maneuver. When I pick up this cast iron, my thumb rests very close to the pan body, not very far out on the handle. On the Demeyer, my thumb is out here, and even though this pan is a pound lighter, it is significantly more difficult to move around. Now, I am obviously very strong and powerful, but I gotta say, this pan is kind of tough to move. It definitely needs the helper handle, and I've noticed when I cook, picking it up and trying to either pour out food or if I do a pan sauce, scrape it out. It's pretty darn difficult. If you have any trouble with the weight of pans, you will probably actually not like this Demeyer. It is significantly heavier and more difficult to move around than other pans, even with that helper handle, which is absolutely necessary. So this is not a pan you want to use to move or flip food. Like my wife says about me watching football on a Saturday afternoon, it's kind of heavy and just sits there. For the anti-rivetists around here, people who don't like rivets on frying pans, probably like this one, the handle and the helper handle are welded, so no rivets on the inside. So let's jump into some cooking tests and see how this thing performs. Now with a big, thick, heavy pan like this, when it comes to cooking, we're going to need to take extra time to preheat the pan. I noticed that when I heat this thing up on the stove top, usually takes at least a minute longer than other pans that I'm used to. Usually somewhere around three minutes or so, uh, sometimes up to four minutes, depending on which cooktop I'm using. I'm gonna start out here with some chicken persillade. La ti da. Um, I've been watching a bunch of Jacques Pepin videos. I learned this from Jacques Pepin, now I make it all the time. I'll put a link to his recipe video below if you wanna try it. Pretty simple recipe and a really delicious payoff. What we're gonna do is take some chicken breasts, cube those up, lightly season those with a little bit of flour, salt, and pepper, and I'm gonna saute these in some butter and olive oil 
for a few minutes. Don't want to overcook these here, but I do want to get a little browning and a little bit of color on there. And what you see here is that we're getting nice, even frying, nice, even sauteing here in the Demeyer edge to edge. And what makes this chicken persillade is when the chicken is ready and almost done, we're going to add some chopped garlic and parsley. And I noticed I had a few sticky bits on the bottom of my pan. I added a little bit of butter and a little bit of stock to deglaze those. And absolutely delicious, often cooking here, and the Demeyer produced an absolutely fantastic centerpiece for this delicious meal. And I mentioned that the pan is very heavy. When I lifted that pan to get the food out and scrape out that pan sauce, very, very heavy, very unwieldy, and I think lots of people, especially if you're a little old lady, would have a lot of trouble with the weight of this pan if you're trying to lift it up or move it around. Browning meat. I uh, got the old Costco pack, the old supermarket pack of ground beef here. Actually looks very natural and delicious. Now they sell this meat by weight. Do they add water to it? Who knows, but there's a lot of steam and bubbling in this ground beef. And I can drag a spatula through here and nothing is sticking. Once that moisture evaporates and steams away, then we get some sizzling and crackling and browning. And I thought the, the Demeyer did a nice job here. Got my taco seasoning in there made some nice weeknight tacos. Very similar with this uh, lunchtime fajitas. Um, bought a steak and sliced that up and made some lunchtime fajitas. Got nice browning on the meat there and go the peppers and a nice plate of lunchtime fajita meat. So we're getting nice browning. Here I have some yellow squash. Yuck! How do you make yellow squash delicious? You slice it up and fry it. But I like to cook these yellow squash early on when reviewing a pan because I can place these around the pan and see if they brown at relatively the same rate. Okay, these have gone three minutes on that first side. Let's see how they look. Okay, so I'm getting pretty good sizzling edge to edge. These over here look a little bit darker than these. Okay, so that's about three minutes on the second side. Let's give the pan a shake and see if anything is sticking. No, and that is, of course, because we have oil in there, but also we're cooking at the correct temperature. What I'm gonna do now, because it seemed like right around here it didn't cook quite as brown as the others, I'm gonna turn the pan around on the eye here and see if that affects anything. Okay, let's see how the second batch is doing. Nice browning. So I'm gonna say that once again, these over here are a little bit darker than these up on this upper corner here. Now I turned the pan for this batch. In the first batch, they were a little bit lighter in this area. I rotated at 180 degrees, and they're a little bit lighter in this area. I'm gonna say that is not the pan. That might just be my stove and the way I have this thing sitting on there. So it looks like the pan is very even and perhaps more even than my cooktop. So this third batch here, it seems like it's cooking a lot faster. This is a big, thick, heavy pan, and it may have just continued to heat up and heat up while I cooked the first two batches. This third batch cooking a little quicker. I turned the thermostat down, but because this pan is so thick and heavy, it may not be quite as responsive. It's a little bit thinner pan, and it may have taken a little bit longer for that change to take effect. So I was cooking up around six or seven, went back down to six or five, and then I went down to four. So a full three notches, and these were still cooking very fast. So this pan, thick and heavy, it might not be quite as responsive as a thinner pan. And what I like about fried squash is you can take a vegetable, like a squash, which is 90, 95% water, bread it, fry it, and give it a nice crunch. Delicious. Now, as far as size of this pan, I've been talking about how big this pan is. Here I wanna show that the pan can hold eight, yes, eight boneless pork chops at once without any crowding. Eight pork chops in one pan. Um, one reason it's taken me so long to do this review is I don't often need to use a pan that's this big, but when we have people coming over for Sunday dinner, family coming over, you need to cook up eight pork chops in one pan, this thing worked fantastically. Okay guys, I have moved down to the basement kitchen. Why? Because I have an electric flat top stove down here and I want to check how this pan does 
on a flat top. Um, now, if you like golden oak as much as the previous owners of this house seem to, this is the place you want to be. Let's see, I got a couple of good looking ribeyes here. We're going to do a little bit of a high temp sear test. And the reason I went with these steaks is I think this pan is so big that it can hold two ribeye steaks. We're going to see how that goes. I've also got a little red wine, some butter, some shallots, and some French mustard. We'll see if we can make a little bit of a pan sauce. And I've also got my Thermopin arsenal ready to go. This is my Thermopin 1 fantastic food thermometer. I've also got the Thermopin surface probe thermometer. So we may do a little probing and take a few readings. Let's get started. Anyway, I'm going to heat the pan slowly then bring it up to heat. We're going to wait until water rolls around like little ball bearings. Okay, we're getting some ball bearings now. This pan holds two ribeye steaks. That's how big it is, and there's still plenty of room in the pan. Okay, this is two minutes. Pretty good sear. Let me get some butter in here so these things don't dry out. Turn it down a little bit, and now we're going to finish them the way we like them. It's actually very difficult to lift this pan to get that sauce out of there. My mom told me never talk with my mouth full. She also told me not to cuss and drink. So one out of three, not too bad. It gets you in the Hall of Fame in baseball. Regardless, those steaks with the pan sauce I thought were absolutely delicious. The uh, Demeyer on the high temp sear test on the flat top, it did not warp. We got that pan screaming hot, smoking, and it didn't warp. So I really do like that. It has a lot of thermal mass. It's a thick, heavy pan. It can kind of maintain a sear. When it comes to searing a steak, one of these high temp sear tests, I still prefer a good cast iron or a carbon steel for that task. But I think the uh, stainless steel here, if you need one pan that does everything, it did a more than adequate, really good job on those steaks. So if you like a thicker, heavier stainless steel skillet, one with a lot of thermal mass that produces delicious food, and you don't mind getting out your wallet, this DeMeyer ProLine Atlantis is a fantastic choice. It's a thumbs up. Now, as we YouTubers say, don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Leave your questions, comments, and feedback below. Check out the shopping links if you want to get one of these for yourself. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time on Uncle Scott's Kitchen.